Good morning. Bonjour. Bon dia. Assalamu alaikum from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Dr. Joel Amegba. I am an assistant professor for security studies and the Africa Center faculty lead on youth, peace, and security. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to friends, colleagues, and partners across the African continent and here in the U.S. and beyond who have registered for today's webinar entitled Security Sector Governance, Elevating Youth Voices. This webinar builds on the momentum of our webinar entitled Trends, Youth Bulge, Security and Peace in Africa, a webinar that convened a panel of experts reflecting on youth bulge as a mega trend on the continent. Today's webinar will be conducted in English, French, Portuguese, and Arabic. To select your preferred language, please click on the interpretation button in your Zoom menu. On a laptop, this is found along the menu bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're using a mobile device, you may have to click on more and select the interpretation option. Before I introduce the objectives for today's uh, webinar and begin the conversation, I'd like to turn over to our director, Ms. Amada Dori, for remarks. Thank you, Dr. Joel, and good morning. Bonjour. Bom dia. Assalamu alaikum. Siku nzuri dumela. So very pleased to be with you this morning, greeting you from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. As Dr. Joelle said, my name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the Africa Center's director. And we are so very pleased to be partnering today with the African Union's Office of the Youth Envoy and Youth for Peace program to continue this series of webinars that are focused on the critical role of youth in Africa. We're delighted to be joined by an outstanding panel as well to discuss the topic of how to amplify the voices of youth in security sector governance. This has generated quite a bit of interest uh, the participants who have signed up come from more than 40 African countries, 10 European countries, and of course, the United States. So I'm looking forward to an excellent dialogue this morning. For those who don't already know the Africa Center, we were chartered by the U.S. Congress 25 years ago to conduct academic programs and research related to security challenges in Africa and how the United States can partner with African countries to tackle those challenges. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions that are accountable to their citizens, including youth. Our program today is conducted in support of that vision using our methodology that focuses on peer learning, dialogue, and identifying ways to catalyze strategic solutions. Before I turn you back to Dr. Joelle, just very briefly, all of our research is posted on our website that's available to you at www.africacenter.org in multiple languages. And I thought I would mention our most recent release that just came out yesterday that's focused on the key elections in 2023. And as you know, there are a series of very important presidential elections and legislative elections that will occur uh, to include presidential elections in seven countries. Some of the most populous countries, Nigeria, DRC, as well as Zimbabwe, Gabon, Liberia, Madagascar. So there's a lot at stake in the coming election cycle. And a third of the population of the African continent is covered in those seven countries alone. So obviously a key year for elections and uh, the, the role of youth and, and all citizens in expressing their preferences. So with that, I'd like to conclude this welcome and turn you back over to Dr. Joel for the program. Thank you, Ms. Dory. Let me introduce the objective for today's uh, webinar. In this webinar, uh, we hope to explain the principles of effective, accountable security sector governance and potential role for youth. We'll, we hope to expand our understanding and share the practical experiences of youth engagement in security sector governance in Africa. 
We hope to explain and explore and examine lessons learned and practical approaches for fostering youth involvement in security sector governance across the African continent. Our panelists will outline how security sector governance approaches can catalyze the transformative and sustained changes needed to realize the YPS agenda across the continent. Let me uh, introduce the panelists so we can jump straight into our conversation. I am pleased and well uh, to welcome three distinguished experts who will help us develop the objectives that are shared based on the wealth of their knowledge. You have their full biographies on the, web, on the website, on the webinar website, and also pasted into the Zoom chat. So I'll just highlight a few, a few pertinent things about our panelists uh, just uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page. I'll start with uh, uh, Colonel uh, Abdul Njai. Uh, his bio, I'll read it in French. Colonel Abdul Ndai is the former director of For information and relations of the armies of Senegal. Senegal. Uh, having entered military service in 1986, Colonel Ndai held several positions in the Senegalese army, army Senegalese including yeah, operational yeah, artillery functions, functions in the general staff, and a chief of general staff of the president uh, of the Republic. Like permanent secretary uh, of the National Commission for Border Management, um, permanent uh, secretary of the National Committee in charge. He um, uh, worked in many institutions around the world, including Senegal, Mali, Ghana, France, and Italy. Welcome, Colonel Abdul Ndai. Now, let me turn over to Dr. Rooks Ako. Uh, Dr. Rooks Ako is a senior analyst with the Political Affairs, Peace, and Security Department of the African Union. Commission, where he coordinates the Youth for Peace Africa program. He jointly oversaw the completion of the AU Continental Framework on Youth, Peace and Security, as well as the AU Peace and Security Council mandated study on the role and contribution of youth to peace and security in Africa. Dr. Rooks is a qualified lawyer with doctorates in environmental justice, natural resources governance and conflict. Welcome Dr. Rooks. Thank you, Joel. Wonderful. And then uh, let me introduce my, my dear colleague, Dr. Kat Kelly. Dr. Katrin Leonard Kelly is an Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor of Justice and Rule of Law at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Her work focuses on party politics and democratization, rule of law and security sector governance, and the transnational organized uh, crime. She is faculty lead for the rule of law and security sector governance portfolio, as well as the transnational organized crime portfolio. Uh, Dr. Kelly holds a PhD and a MA in government from Harvard University, a graduate certificate in international politics from the University Libre de Bruxelles, and a BA from Washington University in St. Louis. She is a council, she is a member of the Council of Foreign uh, Relations. We are absolutely delighted to have the three of you on this panel. So let's start the conversation. And for this conversation, I'll start with Dr. Kat Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kat Kelly, you'll have about you know, seven minutes uh, to, uh, to really address the first question. And, and the hope for us is to really set the stage for our understanding of what security sector governance really means and why young people needs to be involved or why, people, why young people need to think about security sector governance. So for me, the question really is, could you please explain what we mean by security sector governance, highlight why it is important for youth to understand the impact it has on human security and identify potential roles for youth in Africa. Uh, over to you, you have seven minutes. Great, thank you, Dr. Joel, and greetings to everybody who's joined us today. Really pleased to be a part of this conversation. Um, so security sector governance, what is it and what isn't it? Um, the first thing I think that's worth pointing out um, that you will find in many documents, if you try to read around about this, um, is that governance is not the same thing as government. <clears throat> so the government are the institutions of the state, um, which may be responsible for delivering parts of security, uh, but governance is a much broader thing. So governance refers to rules, to norms, to processes, to different practices that are both formal and informal. Um, so they can be embedded in 
public policy, they can also be a part of society and societal practices. And we're looking at this range of rules, norms, processes, and practices on the formal and informal level that influence how power and authority are exercised to make decisions about security. And good security sector governance usually focuses on, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> focuses on <clears throat> what happens in a country um, within a, on a national level um, to produce security and security policy decisions, security strategies, security activities, projects, and programs. So we're looking at how a wide range of actors work together to produce security that we hope is citizen-focused and citizen-centered. So good security sector governance um, uh, we see um, happening when there is a provision of transparent, accountable, and legitimate security to citizens on the basis of democratic and civilian control over the security sector. So those are fancy words, but that really means that there is oversight of how security is delivered as a public good to citizens uh, by the state and sometimes by other actors outside of the state, maybe in conjunction with or in collaboration with the state. Um, and so this is really based on principles like the balance of powers across the three different branches of government um, and um, on transparency, legitimacy, and accountability in the institutions and the processes that are used to ensure that this kind of people-centered security is delivered properly, efficiently, effectively, et cetera. Um, so hopefully that gives you a general sense of what we're talking about. A wide range of institutions, actors, and processes are involved. Um, so I think one, one good resource on this that everyone should consider consulting um, is the Geneva Center for Security Governance's Guide on Good Security Sector Governance. And there they delineate seven principles that I think are worth reiterating to the audience here. So I'll do that now. One is accountability. That means there are clear expectations for security provision and independent authorities are able to oversee whether these expectations are met and impose sanctions if they are not met. So that's principle number one, accountability. Another one is transparency. Information is available about how security is being provided and it's accessible to those who want to know. Rule of law is another really core principle of good security sector governance. And that means everyone is treated um, similarly under the law. Everyone is an agent or an actor under the law. So all people, whether there are those who govern or those who are um, um, citizens um, subject to the, are all subject to the laws. Those laws are well known to everybody. They're enforced impartially and they're consistent with standards of, um, you know, that are relevant on the local, the national and the international level for human rights um, and people's treatment by the state. Participati participation is important, and this is one place where youth voices definitely need further elevation. Um, so people from all backgrounds, of all genders, of all ages, are involved in security sector processes, whether that's the creation of a security strategy, oversight of particular kinds of security policies, getting information about what is happening in relation to the security and defense sector in one's country. Everybody um, should have some sort of stake and some sort of way to voice their opinions about these pieces of the puzzle. Um, the other three characteristics are responsiveness, meaning that the wide variety of actors involved in delivering security to citizens need to be responsive to citizen needs, citizen experiences, citizen challenges in relation to security, and then effectiveness and efficiency. And both of these principles, effective provision of security, efficient provision, deal with how well security resources are managed, how well security strategies or policies are implemented or reiterated or adapted to what the needs of citizens are. And of course, youth are a large portion of the citizenry in a variety of African countries. And so I think inherently um, should and can be um, a really key part of this process of good security sector governance in their countries. Now I wanted to spend um, the rest of my seven minutes, Joelle, I know I'm probably a little bit low on time, talking about who is actually involved in good security sector governance, which people and which institutions um, are involved in this. And I think um, I had mentioned before, formal checks and balances across the three branches of government 
are really critical elements for making security sector governance work for everybody. Um, and so, for example, one of the mainstays of security sector governance is the strengthening of civilian checks on military power through formal oversight and formal regulation of the defense and security sector, which is charged with the really important duty of um, you know, defending the territory and protecting citizens. Um, so this can occur through a wide variety of external controls. So this can be these controls or this oversight can be exercised by parliament, by the judiciary, um, whether a military justice system or a civilian justice system, and institutions that are formal um, within the state, like independent human rights commissions or independent anti-corruption commissions can also play a role in providing this kind of people-centered oversight that is necessary for good security sector governance. There are also internal controls. So inspectors or auditors within the defense and security sector institutions also play a role in overseeing the behaviors um, and the actions and activities of the defense and security um, forces. And also um, in various cases, um, you know, are in some way serving the citizen as well by exercising these roles and responsibilities. So all of these institutions can bolster rule of law, one of the really important principles underlying good security sector governance, when they actually ensure that no security sector institution is allowed to abuse its power or arbitrarily use force um, to restrict the rights of individuals um, and that no actor in the security sector should benefit themselves from impunity um, for um, any sort of um, action uh, that, that is um, out, outside of the line of the rules. Um, in practice, of course, making these formal institutions work to their uh, maximal potential is a significant challenge and I'm happy to discuss that a bit more in the Q&A, but these key institutions, all of which youth can more proactively engage with or can come up with strategies to engage with and voice their, their opinions or provide information to, that's a key piece. Another really key piece um, are external actors in civil society. Um, and so good security sector governance is also quite dependent on the work of civil society groups, civil society organizations, the media, uh, which reports and socializes um, in information about uh, security sector to, to citizens. It might also involve customary and religious authorities, women's groups, youth groups um, that are, are, are um, organized to, in particular, voice you know, youth priorities um, on some of these issues. And sometimes even non-state security sector providers might work in conjunction with uh, civil society or the state to be part of this set of actors who are all working together and checking and balancing one another in terms of how security as a public good that is people-centered gets delivered and articulated. So I think um, hopefully you see through this why youth should care about security sector governance and get to know the security sector a little bit better. Um, citizen people-centered security is essential to peace, security, prosperity, and development um, around the world, including in Africa. And um, people-centered and citizen-centered security is a duty of the security sector in your countries to provide. And so um, when there is good security sector governance, these institutions and actors will work in complementarity with a robust system of checks and balances to ensure that the defense and security sector, which controls uh, the means of coercion in the country, um, are working in tandem with citizen needs and are also um, not posing threats um, that are blocking them from fulfilling other parts of their duties. Um, they are um, there to serve and protect um, citizens. And so um, increasing the dialogue, I think, between the security sector and African youth, urban and rural, men and women, boys and girls, is a really key piece of making security sector governance something that is more realizable and beneficial to all. So I'll stop there, Joel. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I think this is a very good introduction. And so I'll move quickly to uh, our doctor, uh, colleague, Dr. Rooks uh, Ako from the African Union to complement what you've just said. And Dr. Rooks, uh, the, the question for you really is to share with uh, our audience uh, from the African Union perspective, how security sector governance approaches can catalyze you know, the change needed to realize the YPS agenda across the continent. Over to you, you have seven minutes. 
thank you so much, uh, Joel. It's uh, good to see you today. Um, and of course, join my uh, fellow panelists, uh, Kat and uh, Cornel Abdul uh, in this conversation. And uh, it's a big welcome to everyone who's joined. I'm, I'm glad to see that we have a really good number of um, folks on, 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 this, on this platform. Uh, for brevity of time, let me um, swing straight into the question. Uh, and I think one, one thing that we can do is to, first of all, start with what we refer to as the baseline in conversations regarding youth and the security sector, you know, before we then talk, I mean, of, of the governance of it. And I think in Africa, the first thing you, you, you think about when you hear youth security sector is, if you like, the disconnect between both, the, 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 the apparent mistrust that exists between both. Um, and I think in almost equal measures, as a matter of fact, um, and this mistrust underlies, if you like, the long term structural disconnect between what should be the fundamental contributions of both of them to the security of a country. And security here, I'm referring to the definition um, as used in the AU um, security sector reforms policy, which re re refers to both, if you like, uh, the state-centric uh, approach, as well as the human security approach. So it's all embraced. Um, now, the question then is, what should be done? And I think Kat has touched on some of these. Um, and I would like to refer to a few of the principles which she mentioned, you know, in, in, in engaging this conversation so that it, you know, we, we have a, a sort of a conversation that flows uh, in, in tandem. Um, she referred to um, questions around what makes, you know, the, the seven principles, but I'll touch on maybe three or four as, as, as uh, key examples. Uh, the first one is in, in terms of accountability. What comes to your mind when you talk about accountability? You are holding someone responsible for their deeds or misdeeds, which means you must know what they are entitled to do, the limits of what they are supposed to do, and the repercussions when they overstep the boundaries of that which they are supposed to do. In other words, this is a conversation that needs knowledge. That's the first thing. The second is about transparency. When we talk about transparency, what are we, what are, what are we really referring to? Essentially, that things are not hidden. Things are not opaque, right? So um, if there, are, there is going to be, uh, as, as a really bottom line example, if there's going to be a protest by young people, you don't wake up in the night, arrange yourselves and jump in the streets in the morning. There's a process. And the return process is that secu the security sector, the police usually in this case, is to provide protection for both the citizens and those engaging in the protest. And we've seen the examples come out where you know, the lack of information has created uh, a conflict. Uh, the third thing which underlies all of this that I'm going to pick on is participation which is young people should be involved in security sector governance, which is the main, uh, the crux of this conversation. However, for them to be involved, for them to participate actively in the security sector, it comes back to that first thing I mentioned, trust, and then second, knowledge. You need to be aware of what the structures are, what their powers are, the limits and the repercussions before you can even think about actively engaging them in a way that is meaningful. The second thing is you need to then engage with them. But the big question here is how? First, that mistrust has to be killed. Second, we need to encourage conversations such as this that we're having to be held not just on this sort of international, global, continental platforms, but really going down to the member states, to the local levels within those member states for them to understand the different structures that exist and how they contribute to security. This is essential. Um, Joel, 
The other thing to really take note of, which is coming to the connect YPS and the security sector governance. What is YPS? YPS is simply recognizing the, the roles and the contributions of young people to peace and security. And in this regard, it's no different in definition from security sector reforms or security sector governance, which is both hardcore state-centric security as well as human security. Now, all young peace builders contribute to this, but guess what? They don't know because they'll tell you, oh, I do advocacy or I do community engagement. But to what purpose, what, what's the big purpose that serves? It's all contributing to security governance. So I think the key thing we should take from here is, I don't think one is feeding to the other in that sense, but they complement each other. And the sooner that we begin to understand that and begin to have a rethink about the actual roles that each um, institution, uh, demographic, uh, organization, whatever, plays in that big umbrella, within that big umbrella of security is important. Um, Joel, I know we, we want to aim for seven minutes, so I will give Colonel Abdul 30 seconds from my time, and I'm sure uh, he will appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you, Dr. Rooks. You just made the word uh, a little bit harder for Colonel Abdul, partly because we're going to zoom in on Senegal, right? And, and it, this is the time for Colonel Abdul to really talk about the experience of Senegal in, uh, in, in, in the how you explain it and what security sector governance really means and how, you know, uh, in Senegal, he's a, he's a military person. He can defend uh, his, his colleagues, partly because he talked about issues of trust. So Colonel Abdul, over to you. Uh, really, you have about seven minutes. Uh, to, to zoom in on Senegal and, uh, and to tell us, uh, uh, I'll ask the question in, in French and I think Colonel Abdul will speak in French as well. Uh, mon colonel, quels sont les différents moyens? Dear uh, Colonel, what are the different means which are put in place by the security sector actors uh, to improve to use uh, the force of the young people to encourage uh, peace and security. Um, thank you so much, Joël. Hello to everybody. Hello, Dr. Kelly. Hello, Dr. Rooks. Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Amanda Dory. Hello to everybody in all the languages. As my uh, precedence just uh, spoke, uh, we work on Agenda 2063 of the uh, African Union uh, to work on uh, YPS. Uh, and the reform of the security sec of the sector, of sector security, uh, security sector reform is very important. It's very important to uh, use governance. Um, the reforms of this sector security needs to happen in all the countries. In past conflict countries, uh, in countries which just came out of war, um, and this happens in many states of the country, there is lots of instability. Um, this insecurity needs to have a strong response. We need uh, to reform the sector the security sector and the actors need to reform their roles. Uh, this is the case also for Senegal. In order uh, to put to protect the people, it's important to develop uh, the uh, 2063 agenda of uh, the Africa, African Union and Senegal um, is very involved in this security sector reform. You need to take into account the needs of the individual people of the community. You also need to know the limits of the application. You need uh, to understand that security sector governments are linked to strategy. We have different references established uh, in the country. 
and we would like uh, to use resolution 2050 of uh, the Security Council and the third axis, good governments has as an objective to strengthen institutions. We need to strengthen governance and the institutions to protect the rule of law in order to be able to protect the citizens. In August, Senegal adopted a national security agenda, very complex, and we go above the reforms which were already done. Now we, now we have a national security uh, sector strategy, uh, and we try to coordinate the different actors. Um, so this is very important for the security sector. I give you some examples. The actions which were undertaken uh, were fundamentally uh, to destroy the mistrust which happened among the young people uh, in order to strengthen trust uh, in the different regions, armed forces, they proposed a reform for the recruitment. In the past, there was lots of this functioning. This was linked to uh, my migration. Um, and there was lots of frustration of how the people were recruited. In fact, uh, population suffered under that. And for that reason, we uh, used the reform. Now uh, we use the statistics on demography and the mode of recruitment for the contingent, uh, which was done before the, in this decentralized way. Uh, now we reform this. Uh, we use the quality of the people by region uh, before we recruit them. And the second example, uh, it has to do with the security sector reform. Uh, the armed forces adopted a sectorial reform which respects international guidelines. We adopted uh, Resolution 1325, uh, which was adopted in uh, the 189th session of the United uh, Nations Security Council, and also the protocol of Moputo has been adopted um, in 2003. On a national level, Article 7, 7 um, of uh, 2009 has been adopted. And this says that all human beings are equal before the law. Every man, woman, child. And uh, so the adoption, the adoption of this program helps with the equity of people and also equity of roles. And we uh, focus on social sectors. We also um, counter sexist and non-gender uh, based programs which we had before. I mean, now the women are included. Uh, women are also actors who are very important uh, for the protection of the security. And so we use uh, the advice of and the counsel of women and also for the armed forces, their voices are important. For the strategy, we use the gender parity. We use youth, the voices of youth so that we have a better qualitative um, 
regrouping of people in the army in the contingents it is important that we have transparency of the people who have access to arms at last armed forces uh, do more than only military actions and it this happens in all of the regions of our country since more than four decades. These actions, um, they also help out with sanitary kits which are delivered. Uh, we strengthen trust uh, and we help young people. We motivate them uh, to be recruited in uh, the armed forces. Um, this is important uh, for the security sector. We need to have transparent people who have access to weapons and arms. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Colonel Njai. Uh, very, very, very interesting case for Senegal. And I think we'll dive more into uh, the, the, the gr uh, granul granulality of the Senegalese cases uh, shor shortly. Let me get back to uh, Dr. Kelly. And Dr. Kelly, you've heard what uh, uh, Dr. Rooks said and uh, what Dr. Uh, Colonel Njai also mentioned, and I think really the work for you now is to give us some key elements, right? Key elements, some of some of the key elements that impact citizens' perception of security governance performance uh, uh, across the board, especially sure. uh, in, in Africa. Over to you. Okay, great. Um, well, I think um, the first thing I've, I've consulted the Afro Barometer data source um, to give you a lot of the information I'll be giving you. I feel like um, as the speaker who is not from somewhere on the continent, my job is maybe um, just to point out good data sources and let my colleagues give you the real examples from um, their lived experiences. And so I'm drawing on the Afrobarometer data here um, to give you a sense. Um, for those who don't know, the Afrobarometer is a public opinion data source um, that is based on door-to-door um, -door surveys of ordinary citizens who are randomly selected. Um, it's um, a, a, a pretty large outfit. Um, these surveys are done every few years, every two to three years in 33 or 34 different countries across the continent. And it gives us a really interesting source of information of, that is representative about what African citizens, um, young and younger and older, um, men and women sort of think about a variety of issues. And there's some security and security sector governance relevant information that we can extract there that I think is useful. And so the first point I'll make, um, you know, if you ask people what their biggest problems are, um, regardless of age, um, the things that um, almost everyone agrees on don't necessarily relate to harm security, but they relate to human and citizen security. So there are issues like unemployment, um, health, education, uh, having good quality infrastructure. Um, and so these are things that relate really to how security intersects with development um, and um, maybe to some extent governance um, in the delivery of some of these public services and public goods. And I think if you ask youth, according to the Afrobarometer, the two of those four things they'll prioritize most are unemployment as a problem and education as something they're interested in getting more of. Um, and I think both of those, one could argue, um, then have um, effects on broader security and um, security sector government governance is certainly um, a tool that young people should think creatively about how they can get involved in so as to affect outcomes like these as well. Um, so if you move down to what people then think or how they perceive their security sectors in their countries, I would say we have less, um, we, we have quite a bit of information in the Afrobarometer by country. So Colonel Njai was saying the Senegalese context is very specific, but there are a wide variety of other experiences people have with security and security sector governance. You could argue the same in terms of trust in organizations like the military, the police, the justice system and the courts members of parliament who are part of um, the security sector governance process, local elected leaders who are part of that process, um, traditional authorities, and the Afro barometer tracks how much trust people indicate they have in these different entities. And frankly, frequently the military scores high, the police and the courts score on average lower. Um, and then certain political officials, um, it depends on which kind of political official you're talking about, 
um, how much trust people have in them. So I think, again, it differs according to country and country experience. But some things that shape these levels of trust wherever you look, how the security sector, military, police, gendarmerie, intelligence services, courts, um, how do they have everyday contact with people or do they? Um, I think there are also, as Dr. Rooks mentioned, um, past legacies of how the security sector has engaged or not so much engaged in service of the interests of the populace. And there are big elements of distrust still to overcome in order to transform the security sector and transform security into something that is working in service of young people and their interests um, and their desires and ambitions. So I think mistrust of the security forces can exist for many reasons. Beyond these historical legacies, there are also perceptions of corruption in different defense and security institutions or more broadly across the state in some countries. In um, some countries, you see frustration with slow state responses to crimes. Um, so that could include police response or investigator response in addition to judicial response. All of these institutions' ability to serve the people are sort of linked together in this criminal justice chain. Um, so the operating and functionality of that, the availability of that, that people have or that they perceive themselves to have can matter a lot for what they think about the security sector. Um, I think that there are other ways that people might form their opinions, um, trust or mistrust in the security sector. Some recent elements, the pandemic lockdowns. I can think of African countries or countries all over the world in which there were positive or negative perceptions that people had reinforced or developed based on um, when uh, COVID-19 hit, how the security sector, part of whose job is to manage uh, society and the institutions of the state in an emergency situation, how did they actually do that in service of protecting citizens um, or not? Um, another way that I think people often in uh, their uh, relatively everyday life might interact with security sector officials as a whole is during elections, or as Dr. Rooks mentioned, during protests. And there, it's really important um, that, you know, if you're going to have a, a good security sector governance, rule of law, transparent and accountable sort of relationship that will make this these, these um, the provision of security more um, fit to need and more synergistic, we need to make sure um, that you know, citizens do have the right to express their views peacefully, even if they disagree with the government. And as Dr. Rook said, in return, if they follow the procedures and rules that exist for expressing that discontent, um, there should be sort of mutual um, tolerance and protection um, of what it is that they want to do within the rules, the constitutional rules in the country. I think during elections, also, you have seen in a variety of countries, um, maybe some um, uh, the security sector doing positive things like providing judicial security when um, I'm thinking about Malawi, where there was a challenge um, in court related to the election results and the end of the judiciary, which was trying to act independently to rule um, on this, um, you know, complaint that was lodged was experiencing security threats. Um, so there are different ways it, more positively as well that citizens might be seeing the security sector getting involved to protect processes that are part of a good um, system of security governance. And then finally, um, and this is pretty classic, I think Colonel and Jai might be able to speak to it better than myself, but militaries and police do civil military engagements. Police might engage in community-based policing. So really, um, you know, sending out officers who get to know and embed themselves in particular communities to understand problems, challenges, and um, you know, build those people-to-people -people relationships that can make policing uh, more effective. Um, in addition, militaries have civil military engagements of various sorts, some of which may deal with the infrastructure issues that people cite as some of their main concerns, um, some of which might touch uh, more closely on um, you know, some of the other elements um, of security challenges that citizens care about the security sector helping them deal with. Um, finally, I would say, um, you know, the Afrobarometer does note um, that young people are not necessarily reporting to them that they're doing all of the forms of community engagement that they might be able to, to connect, um, you know, to the security sector and through civic actions. Um, so they're good at contacting, for example, their members of parliament who are part of this oversight process. And they're good at contacting members of parties that they may feel affiliated with or want to act on their behalf. 
they're not as frequently attending community meetings, contacting local government counselors or officials, contacting traditional leaders about issues that they care about. Um, so there are certain forms of civic engagement um, that maybe some of these perceptions about which channels are most effective for young people to engage, that might explain part of what the Afrobarometer is showing here across 18 different countries in Africa that were surveyed. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. You've given us a, a lot to chew on. And so let me turn on to, uh, to uh, Dr. Rooks. Uh, again, this time around, based on your, your personal experience, we, we, we we're following the elections that are coming up in Nigeria. And I think we also wanted to hear from your personal experience this time around, some of the practical approaches that you think right, uh, 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 yeah, leaders can use to foster you know, youth involvement in security sector governance across the, the African continent. And also, if you could give us some, you know, uh, some ways or some, some anti, uh, anecdotes on how we can, you know, leaders can engage young people in decision-making processes that affect security sector governance uh, on the continent. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joel. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the question on how governments uh, can include uh, youth in, in, in the security sector governance is um, quite apparent from my first uh, response, which is simply saying that, you know, the whole notion of YPS is giving that practical recognition that young people are peace builders, young people carry out activities that positively uh, impact on uh, security sector governance. And it really doesn't matter what sector of youth participation. So be it in advocacy, th there's a role to play in telling society that these are the powers of the police. And if the police steps beyond this, these are the remedies. That's contributing to security sector governance. And I don't think um, we, should be telling governments how to do that. I think that already exists. What we need to focus on perhaps more is giving that recognition of the roles that young people already play in society. There's, there's no gain saying the fact that they have those roles, they play them, and what they need is protection, support, enhancing their capacities and experiences to further contribute positively, and let's not take away the fact that there aren't those who have negative impacts, okay? But um, those that are working to promote, to uphold these various institutions and, and the way they work, the way they interact with society need to be recognized. I think that is what it is. Because when we talk about youth and the security sector, any one of us, would immediately think of a young man gone totting, looking for where to create mayhem. But this is not the case. I have worked with now 10 youth ambassadors, five in the first court, five in the second court. And Joel, um, uh, they were uh, 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 an institution, uh, event you, they, we, we, we both hosted. There are several millions of young people like that who are knowledgeable, who are willing, able, and are in fact giving their time to society, to better society. So what are, we do what are we saying? Are we saying we need governments to create them? No, they exist. What we need is to provide them with a framework that enables them to do more, that protects them from the overstretching or overreaction of this security sector that we're talking about due to the mistrust that exists over significantly long periods of time. And what is the response to this? On the continent, drawing of course from the African Youth Charter and um, um, the UN Security Council resolutions on YPS, we now have a continental framework on youth peace and security. And what does it seek to do? What it seeks to do is to ensure that these elements I've talked to you about are enmeshed in one document, a one-stop shop, and it is not meant to then, if you like, guide the entire continent, but it's supposed to be that framework that we then encourage member states 
to look inwards to their particular circumstances and where they see young people needing that recognition, protection, encouragement, okay, to then hone in on those areas and prioritize them. And this is why we're working with the youth ambassadors, with the member states, with the African Union Peace and Security Council to encourage our member states to adopt not the continental framework, but national action plans on youth peace and security. And this is significant because what it says is you're not adopting a national action plan based on the framework, the continental framework, but based on the youth peace and security agenda. So where you are to borrow from youth in peace processes, for example, there's a UN Security Council resolution on that that you can borrow extensively from contextualized within the, 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 the framework of the continental um, framework on youth, peace, and security, and then localize. So this is what within the African Union uh, we're pushing for. And you, you, you were asking for a couple of um, anecdotes, and I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, we, we, we at the African Union also recognize the importance of youth participation in security sector governance. And last year, we as a big team. So we had uh, the Silence in the Guns Unit, we had the Youth for Peace uh, Africa program, we had um, our SSR DDR um, division as well, and we were in South Sudan. This is, you know, a, a country that really needs, you know, uh, a combination of um, SSR and some transitional justice elements. And the conversation with the young people was, where do you see yourselves in these conversations? What do these things mean to you? And it was interesting that from the conversations, it seemed like they thought this was something that happened only in South Sudan. And this is where I keep also saying, experience sharing is absolutely crucial now, let me quickly touch an anecdote on elections. Um, a couple of years ago, just before the um, Ethiopian elections, using a big, you know, like I, I, I know you were you know, sort of referring to the big demographics, um, we felt that young people needed to come out more, be more participatory, be more engaged. Because if you don't know the issues, if you don't know the political system, how then do you cast a meaningful vote, you know? Um, and we had a conversation around young people, their roles in governance, their role in political processes, and their roles in elections, three different things. And we brought in young people from the Gambia, which had similar experiences from Nigeria, okay, and other countries to engage and share their experiences and how they went through what was a testing political timeline for their different countries as young people. And I think these sort of exchanges, these sort of um, peer to peer learning experiences are key because trust, trust me, you don't need a political expert to talk to young people. That expert is knowledgeable of the political process and um, engagements of their time. They may keep up with literature, yes, but they leave the experiences are with the young people. And so we must always encourage by providing the resources, the time, the platform, the money to ensure that these conversations continue to take place. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Dr. Rooks. Like Dr. Kelly, you've given us a lot to chew on. And then hopefully our colleagues on the line are listening and uh, are already typing some of the questions for you and Dr. Kelly and Colin Jai. Now, let me turn over to uh, Colonel Jai. And Colonel Jai, like uh, Dr. Rooks, would like you to speak you know, from your personal experience. If you could give us three most important steps, security sector governance uh, as, uh, actors or security sector actors in Senegal can uh, use or across the continent can take to ensure that youth and others who are often marginalized uh, in security sector processes and security sector policy uh, decision-making are increasingly involved and empowered to effectively participate in uh, in security sector. Uh, you have about five to seven minutes as well. Over to you. Please speak from your personal experience. I think that's what colleagues would like to hear. Thank you. 
Euh, merci. Euh, J'ai même vu il y a Thank une question. You. I see that there was a question addressed to me earlier concerning the security sector actors and youth, the interaction of both. So we went through experiences in Senegal two years earlier this year in March, which were unfortunate. And whether it's on a national level or continental level, this is important. Something important that explains this lack of trust is the lack of work. It's the high unemployment of young people. Because if we analyze the structure of the population in Senegal, the censor of 2016 showed that over 60% of Senegalese are under uh, 20 years old, but, but with a very high unemployment. So the need of education, the need of training, and the need, there needs to be work after this that is available. So in terms of the young people who over 15 years of age that are seeking work um, are, present a very large percentage of the country. There are some projects and programs put in place. The, um, there is also national programs of civil service that have been put in place. And these structures are working towards finding work for youth, but in spite of the efforts undertaken, the opportunities for work remain limited for young people. It is also necessary from my point of view to have new programs and to, in terms of the impact they can have on young people. I think there's been a lack of synergy of harmonization and all of these efforts which leads to, there are some organizations, certain agencies that work for uh, youth employment, others come from the judicial system, some of the projects, others. So it is important that there be a harmonization of the different agencies. There needs to be more synergy among all the efforts made. And most importantly, there has to be an evaluation of these programs after the fact. And in terms of these programs that already exist, there is also a lack of good communication, especially for the youth living in the rural areas or suburban areas. They're not even aware that these programs exist. So we really need to have a better um, uh, aware awareness building and communications program. Because youth unemployment in Senegal is a real, real cause of tension. And therefore, the youth is very vulnerable, uh, uh, not just in the cities, but in the rural areas. They are very, very vulnerable to jihadist groups. So I think one of the fundamental problems of mistrust is linked to the fact that young people cannot find work. And I think that the energy that they deploy for pro protests or that they uh, or in social media, it could be it could be really put to better use, their perspectives could uh, be better communicated. For example, there has been uh, much reform in terms of the army. 
uh, in recruitment of the young. Now we uh, recruit 3,000 young people each year in the military. But, but then after a, year, a couple of years in the military, they're let go and this does not fix the situation. So the army now has a program that helps young people who leave the military after their service to find employment. They are given training for particular um, jobs. Before we, we, we kind of put the cart before the oxen in the past. So the most important thing is to train and educate people, for example, in agriculture and fishing and in, in, in other areas where work can be found. And so now many soldiers, um, after they have finished their service, are being well formed and they can get some financing to go into those arenas. I also think, secondly, that um, Senegal has a security police, but it's important that this police be strengthened also, that their capabilities be strengthened. A few years ago, Senegal had what we call municipal police. That no longer exists. With the decentralization that took place, as now we have there are cities, departments can, that have their own uh, economic development entities and also local police. So in terms of the skills that um, are needed, we are using community policing to help the local populations to create awareness and then this can strengthen and the trust between the youth and the security and defense forces so also there is the uh understanding that the police does its work. Sometimes there is legitimate force, but we need to ensure that with community policing, um, we need more, uh, we need the community policing in all sectors, in the rural sectors, in the suburban sectors, as well as in the urban sectors. And I think that we can also through this community policing, uh, strengthen trust between the police forces and youth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Colonel Jai, for giving us a, a very good. Uh... Sorry for that. I'm moving back to English. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, thank you, Colonel Jai, for giving us a, a very interesting and very uh, uh, eloquent. Uh, contribution from from Senegal and I think you know there are pieces that we're hearing from uh, all other colleagues youth participation is very key very important and the way we, to do so is to create the opportunity create the environment for young people to participate and Dr. Rooks also mentioned that young people are already doing so right young people are already participating and we need to elevate their voices which is definitely the you know the title for our webinar today uh, before we move to the question and answer sessions colleagues if you'd like to ask any questions Please, uh, you can type your questions in uh, to, uh, in the chat in English, French, Portuguese, and uh, Arabic, and then we will pose the questions for you. So let me move on to Dr. Kakeli, and I'll ask you a, a final question before we move to the question and answers. Uh, could you please give us, you know, some of your your personal thinking on how African leaders or leaders even in, in the U.S. or policymakers can engage young people in decision making processes that affect the security sector governance? Sure, thank you, Joelle. Um, I think there are a couple of things, and I, ha I have some thoughts actually um, that relate to what um, young people themselves might do as well. So let me start with that, and then I'll move to African leaders and potentially US, US leaders as well. Um, and this, this is also a statistic and a finding that comes from the Afrobarometer 
surveys that were done in between 2019 and 2021 in, in a variety of different African countries. But one finding, um, and this is an indirect way for you to get involved. There are plenty of more direct ways, but this is an important one. Um, you know, only 14% of lawmakers are under 40. Um, but, um, you know, there more, more youth need to vote than those who are reporting on these surveys that they do. Um, so I think one key element that, again, plays indirectly into how security sector governance may play out, whose interests are represented in those formal institutions that we mentioned earlier, um, even if we don't have as many young MPs or young um, local government officials, um, yet, as as might reflect um, the percentage that they constitute within the populace, exercising your power to vote, and as Dr. Rooks was saying, um, getting a sense of some of the key issues, um, I think is a key action item in addition to other things that young people are already doing to shape security sector governance. Um, in terms of um, the questions about job creation, um, I think that, I mean, we know that there are national youth services um, or service programs in a variety of different African countries. In fact, I know some people who are listening to the webinar today um, are some of the policymakers who are crafting um, what those programs look like, what they're intended to do, how they make how we make sure they reach rural and urban young people um, who may um, welcome an experience in public service that could shape how they get to know um, and engage with the issues that they care about. Um, so I think there are a wide variety of ways to orient national youth service programs. Um, and so maybe that's a future conversation we could all have, or maybe it will come up further in the Q&A. But I think um, public service opportunities like that um, are, are one way amongst many um, that I think leaders, um, can, we, uh, leaders in Africa and the US can encourage that that be sort of an approach that's considered. I think that there are other ways um, looking at things from the state level where young people could get more involved. Um, I know quite a few from some of my own past work. Um, I used to work at the American Bar Association and they have a NGO called the Rule of Law Initiative that used to provide um, US government support to people in different African countries who were doing community paralegal work. So this touches at the heart of peace and security because we're dealing with dispute resolution, mediation issues, formal and informal, um, accompanying people who want to access state courts. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways that um, I saw personally in doing that work, supporting it from Washington with occasional trips out to places like Central African Republic or DRC or Mali. Young people, particularly young people in rural areas, are key for helping people in their broader communities understand when and why the state can be there for them, what other sorts of recourse they have if they have problems that could ignite potentially into broader security challenges in their in their community. Community paralegals know their community. Um, that's this, one of the big strengths they bring to how they engage. And I think that I saw, and there continues to be a big role that young people could play in expanding access to justice or even in mediation. Um, or awareness raising about these kinds of things. Um, so I think that's something that, um, you know, central governments can encourage, particularly places that have legal aid policies on the books, um, laws on the books about how that kind of thing is supposed to work. It seems like there are ample opportunities for young people who want to support these good security sector governance institutions to get involved. I think others mentioned, I believe it was Colonel Ndiaye, open days in the barracks or in the courts. That's an easy way to sort of um, get more conversations going, um, building um, up networks of community police relationships, uh, networks that could strengthen those things, community mediators, um, making strategy and policy processes um, related to national security more consultative than they often are. Um, I know Dr. Joel at the Africa Center, you do work on this in relation to national security strategy development. And there are various parts of that process in many African countries where we have observed there's space for civil society, including youth consultation in an extensive and rigorous way. Um, so making space and time for that, I think, could be well worth um, leaders' considerations. Um, and then finally, there's just a strategic communications element to how the defense and security forces engage with the populace um, that you know I think um, leaders could um, focus on. Um, Colonel Jai gave us some sense of how that seems to be working in Senegal, and I think that's another key area um, where um, things could be done uh, to be 
uh, more effective and synergistic and 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 for for I think donors in addition to African countries and leaders there to consider. I'll finally say I think programs like the Mandela Washington Fellows, the Yali Fellows, we've had the privilege of interacting with multiple cohorts of Yali Fellows at the Africa Center um, on issues related to rule of law, security governance, and just more broadly, um, strategic thinking. And these are really impressive young people. Um, they're an attestation to what Dr. Rook says he sees in his everyday work at the AU level. There are so many people who care about making institutions for good security sector governance, strong and robust. And so I think um, continuing um, on the US side for us to support programs like that um, and provide them um, the tools that they say that they need um, and continuing to do that kind of work is also key. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. And thank you uh, to our panelists for their excellent insights on these critical topics. Uh, 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 thank you for uh, uh, those that are following the conversation online as well, and I hope you really find it uh, useful. Uh, I know with uh, strong interest uh, from uh, Dr. Rooks and uh, uh, Dr. Kelly and Colin Jai that we need to talk about case studies. We need to look at uh, lessons learned, and I think today we're using the Sen Senegal as a, as a case study of lessons learned, and hopefully throughout the, you know, the, the question and answer session, we'll give the chance to uh, Colin Jai to give us uh, additional examples additional insights that other countries or other young people in many other places can learn from. So Dr. Rooks, we have a colleague who is asking about opportunities that exist for young people to be involved in peace and security, uh, in peace and security or in the security sector, particularly at the local level. Uh, that's a question for Dr. Rooks. For Colonel Njai, uh, we have a question about, you know, the, again, somebody's asking about the mistrust between you know the, the 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 army or the security sector and 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 young people, and wanted to know what are some of the strategies that you recommend, right, to bring you know to 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 change that opinion that young people have uh, of the security sector. Uh, and Dr. Kakeli, Dr. Kakeli, also somebody was asking about you know uh, uh, how to empower youth to fight local corruption, for example which is also part of the governance uh, the system that we're talking about. So I'll start with Dr. Rooks this time around and then uh, Karen Jaya next and then Kat, over to you. So uh, uh, Dr. Rooks, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. Um, and I think, um, again, uh, thanks for that question, but I will rephrase it to be, how can youth inv involvement in peace and security at the local level be further encouraged because I keep insisting they, they, they are there, they are doing a lot of work. Um, and I'm going to give um, an anecdote using um, one, one, one of my current um, uh, Africa Youth Ambassadors for Peace. Um, Christian uh, is the representative from uh, Central Africa, and he has a program that works with the security sector, an important one for that matter, um, the prisons. Um, and what he does with his, um, if you like, local organization was to think about why particularly young people who went through the system, ostensibly to be reformed, came out worse off to themselves and society, posing threats, you know, to the immediate community. And what he then did was to engage the services and begin to interact with these pr prisoners through a program he named Prison Preneurs. And over a period of time, what he has seen, we have seen, is that that engagement has done two things. Perhaps he hasn't even realized this, you know, but what it has done is it has opened the eyes of the security sector to the positive role that young people and youth-led organizations and youth-focused organizations can assist the prison system in reforming inmates to ensure that, A, what they are set up to do is optimized, and B, the threats of those inmates when they are released is minimized or mitigated. So a lot of these folks are creating uh, businesses 
from the skills they have learned. You know, and you know, I honestly wish I knew this was going to go this way, and I would have shown you some of the products which I have, and it's 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 really amazing. And what you have seen from this is that these inmates, having benefited from this system, are now investing their time and resources, and it's a ripple effect. So that is one example. Another way. To, I'm sorry, the, what I was, I was going to conclude with, that um, um, initiative has now gained not only national, but regional and continental recognition, all right? And it helps other young people to begin to think about how they can interact. And it also gives these institutions that alternative view as to who youth are youth roles in security sector governance and the society at large. So how can you encourage these sort of examples? Number one is to recognize that they exist. Be more flexible, open, engaging, such that these young people and their youth-led networks, organizations or institutions are able to then approach because sometimes they have the solutions to the problems, you know? So how then do we create that? This is one way, but like I said, we need to take it down to where it matters the most. And I guess this is where that question uh, is coming. How can you know, this be done at the local level? At that local level, what are the systems? The context differ. There are some context where there's still a strong traditional authority wherein you can use those traditional authorities to promote programs and initiatives of young people to society in some of the instances uh, in, in societies where you know they tend to quote unquote be more uh, 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 catholic than the pope then perhaps the religious institutions would be the way to go. So all I'm saying here is we need to be uh, both environment context specific to determine what works in the different societies, but they're there and we just need to figure them out. But the young people in those communities are also best placed to advise on what works in those places. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rooks. I'll turn over to uh, Colonel Jai. Thank you. I think I had partially answered that first question in terms of how to reestablish trust between youth and security forces. As mentioned earlier, there's a great social uh, demand, that, uh, there's a great uh, youth bulge in Senegal. And Senegal has, on a democratic level, uh, now authorized the population and the youth to um, know their rights, to uh, protest when their rights are not uh, adhered to. In terms of, we have to work in the cities as well as in a rural area and understand the difference between the two. So security forces are perceived as being re forces of repression often. So we see this in demonstrations and protests. So we must work to, they have, they are responsible nonetheless of maintaining public order and public uh, peace. And we have the issue with the youth facing high unemployment, and this worsens the situation. So I do believe that the solution we must is that we must coordinate all the programs, all of the projects that are youth related, uh, especially to, to have really um, good results. All of the programs that exist currently, as I mentioned earlier, there really is not an evaluation that I feel it, we can really trust uh, 
in terms of the results of these programs, in terms of the demands of the populations, so Senegal does have tools, though, does have instruments for self-evaluation and to evaluate the programs and the projects that have been implemented and to understand did they or did they not respond to the social needs. If you, in Senegal, there's a structure called PIMO. It's a emergency uh, program. It's uh, that is in place in 10 border areas. And it is to help women and young people to respond in, in a general way to the needs of the population. And in the rural areas, if people are not satisfied, either there's no electricity or no not enough or no water or no jobs. This needs to be addressed. But there is today a situation that is very important of the security and defense forces working together, especially in the border regions to establish relations with the population and to support their needs. This is very important so that they there's a, there's a reciprocal and mutual uh, uh, communication. We can solve some of their problems, but this also allows for a, an awareness building campaign among the populations. For example, at the, especially at the Eastern and Northern borders, there is the issue of the nomads, nomads that uh, travel between, uh, you know, Senegal, Mali, and other neighboring countries. And so these nomadic populations uh, that cross the borders, we work on uh, sensitizing them, on making, of having awareness campaigns to, we distribute uh, health kits, we distribute uh, uh, educational kits for these nomads. And this strengthens the trust between security and defense forces that are in those areas where the nomadic populations travel. And this is very important in these zones and also to fight uh, the influence of jihadism. Our northeast and eastern borders today are the ones that are most threatened by jihadism in, in, the, in the Sahelian region of which we are a part. So if you look at these areas, especially the eastern border, if we look at the needs, the health needs, it's we have to understand that there is, the, the biggest threat amongst this uh, border, cross-border crime is the jihadism. There are new uh, units that have been created uh, in the defense forces to counter this. So the populations uh, must also be implicated in the governance of these border areas. And, and that has been put in place. I think in February of 2020, if I'm not mistaken, which allows uh, these um, regions to better govern the, the border areas. And the African Union has provided also some instruments to, uh, in terms of dealing with uh, boundaries, uh, knowing ex that they also have strengthening of cooperation between the border countries. And so there are some instruments that have been put in place, uh, border operations that include the participation of youth. And in terms of Senegal, Senegal has taken up this strategy. And so the operation of the border area strategy 
of we've developed for this uh, programs of good neighbors. It's called a good neighbor program, including youth. And these are spaces of dialogue, of conversation to um, minimize crises, minimize uh, disputes uh, with persons from the neighboring country on the border areas. We've included the women in particular and, and in the south uh, uh, with Gambia and Mauritania. We were able to reassemble uh, youth from those different countries from the, from both sides of the borders, uh, um, focusing on certain themes of uh, uh, gender violence, uh, focusing on leadership, and these kinds of initiatives, uh, these, uh, these trans-border programs are supported by ECOWAS, supported by the African Union, and they allow uh, support to these populations that are the most vulnerable in these border areas. Thank you. Thank you, Kang Jai. So I'll move to my colleague, Dr. Kat Kelly, for uh, final words and uh, on, on the questions. Sure, I won't take up too much time because I know there are lots more questions. So how to empower youth to fight local corruption? Mm, a very easy question that has been posed, right? Um, I will say, Two things, and I don't think they'll be sufficient, but hopefully they're useful. Um, one is, I think, you know, uh, young people who are working on this um, might, they probably already are networking, but networking across those who do analysis on the local level, those who do advocacy, and those who are doing activism. I think there are a variety of different ways to engage in, uh, you know, anti-corruption sort of activities. And I think all three of those things play different roles in how some sort of oversight that might be youth led um, would come together. And so thinking about coordination and um, experience sharing across those areas um, certainly seems like a useful um, element. Um, I know when you um, look at historically over the last five, 10 years, how some of these desires for a reduction in local corruption have been expressed by the youth. Um, you've seen Ion Amar in Senegal, you've seen Citizens Broom in Burkina, you've seen Lucha and Democratic Republic of Congo. So that's one way um, that we see youth engaging. And I think there are a variety of other ways that are less um, globally seen, um, but that are equally important. And so that's why I mentioned the activism, in addition, but in addition, the analysis and the advocacy um, elements of this. Um, I think that um, another, another thing that um, is important as I think, regardless of what kind of anti-corruption engagement young people might be trying to do on the local level, um, as others have said, they need to be strategic um, and think strategically. And I think one way to do that is to do a political economy analysis, shall we say, of your local context, because each context is different. And um, each, each person's or group's um, kind of knowledge may be unique. So all that means political economy analysis is who are the other actors in this space? where you're working, what are their incentives? Some may have overlapping incentives that you can leverage. Others may have incentives that are counter to yours, but just doing um, a good assessment of um, who is there, um, how that interlocks maybe on the national level with some of the key anti-corruption institutions or CSO networks that one might engage in or try to be a part of. Um, are there particular members of parliament who seem to care about this? The answer, uh, will differ across context. Um, are, are there local officials who are bought into the, um, this kind of agenda or not? And I think that really defines how you balance analysis, advocacy, and activism, um, depending on how you make that analysis. So that's vague, but I think it's intentionally vague because the local context can be so different on these things. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Mon colonel, Colin Jai, il y a un collègue qui a une question pour vous. Uh, there is a colleague who has a question. He would like to know how you put into place the uh, sectorial gender dimension and how this is linked to the armed forces in Senegal. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. As you know, the interaction of women in armed forces is done in a gradual way. Uh, first, uh, you have uh, the health 
the health workers and also the doctors and they are in this category that's how they came to work in the army and these are uh, lots of women were in this capacity. This uh, happened in 83. Um, later, uh, we had other categories of uh, uh, women who entered uh, the armed forces. And the last category entered in 2008. And uh, this was definitely one of our wishes uh, to establish uh, this parity between men and women in the army. And we took into account lots of specificities. You know, there was first a big challenge because we needed to find places uh, to, to lodge them. Uh, it was a problem in the beginning. Uh, so we had to build infrastructure. And then with regards to the police and the gendarmerie, uh, we uh, trained women uh, to use weapons. And these were challenges. We had to take, first of all, into account and work on these challenges. But um, then we worked on a strategy to include more and more uh, women into the armed forces uh, to satisfy uh, the uh, gender dimension. We have different cells to follow now what is happening um, in the different armed categories with the women. So to follow that uh, women are included in the different battalions, in the contingents, uh, because there were um, imbalances. And to uh, remedy uh, to these um, imbalances, uh, we had this cell, we constituted this cell um, so that uh, we were able to interfere when we saw imbalances. For example, there was a, a military uh, a man, uh, and it was only the man who uh, received a bonus. Um, and he also got better lodgings. But then last year, um, this system was changed so that the woman herself can also benefit of the uh, bonus, the bonus for lodging uh, and have her husband join her. Um, Formerly, it was only available to the men. This was a huge reform because before that, women were mainly working on administrative details. We had to train them. Um, and so, and we, and we did. Uh, but um, most of the time in the past, uh, women were in administrative uh, functions. Um, the strategy, uh, the new strategy was adapted, there was uh, this wish to satisfy the need and also to have the possibility for all of the women to benefit from the same benefits and bonuses which the men uh, received. And that's what we did. Thank you so much, Colonel. Dr. Rooks, I have a question for you coming from one colleague, and I think this is in reference to a uh, Colonel Jai's comments about unemployment and uh, Dr. Katkeli's uh, comment also about uh, unemployment uh, as well. Question really is understanding that youth are critical for security. How can the African Union and the African countries coordinate to address widespread issues of youth unemployment and poverty across the borders? Over to you, you have about three minutes. <laughs> uh thank you thank you thank you so much joe um i mean youth unemployment i mean i have i have a somewhat <laughs> a different approach to this um i think the first first place to start is what are the opportunities and the opportunities that they are in today's world aren't catered to in the if you like traditional traditional employment uh, spaces wherein governments created those jobs. I mean, now you're looking at, you know, sort of FinTech, ICT, you know, and, 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 and you know, um, um, uh, what you call it? Um, tick, uh, I don't want to say TikTok, but, you know, being uh, media influencers, you know, all the, these are jobs. These are, are, are 
new sectors that are opening the entertainment sector okay um so what i what what i tend to do is to say what and how can we encourage institutions multilateral institutions such as the african union and member states to recognize these um contemporary uh, sectors where young people are the most fitted to go into and begin to recognize them as spaces where government incentives should reside in terms of tax breaks and set up um, um, uh, grants and the likes, okay? Um, I remember in Nigeria last year when there was an issue with uh, Twitter and there was a lot of uproar, not from those who used it for um, social interaction, but from those who use the platform for their businesses. And it was said, you're not giving us jobs and you're taking away the source of our jobs from us. So this then means that there has to be these realization and conversations around the use of media and how they are employment, for example, as against the state-centric notion of them being used to, if you like, attack governance. Um, so I don't want to go through the whole um, thing about create jobs. AFC, FTA is another thing, okay? Are young people realizing the potential there? Are young people realizing how they can use that policy to drive their business ideas? Are they looking at how the freedom of movement of persons, how you can move to another country and stay for you know, up to 90 days without the need of a visa? What are young people doing to push member states to adopt the AFCFTA and implement them? For me, this is the new thinking. I think uh, this notion of government creating job is old, it's tired, and we need to um, look into contemporary notions. Uh, thanks, Joel. Thank you, Dr. Rooks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelly, and thank you, Colin Jai. Uh, on this note, uh, I would like to, uh, on behalf of the Africa Center, uh, the Office of the African Union Youth Envoy and the African Union Youth for Peace Program, thank our panelists for their insights today. We've learned so much from them. They've given us so much that we can, uh, you know, we can take more time to even unpack if uh, uh, here or, or, or outside of uh, uh, this platform. Uh, I also would like to say thank you to our participants and uh, for those who join us from far uh, on the continent, uh, here in the U.S. and in many other places. Thank you so much for listening to uh, to, the, to uh, our panelists. On this note, I'll end the the, the webinar. Uh, at this point, we will record the recording will be on our website, and so for those that would like to go in and uh, and listen to it or perhaps uh, re rewatch it again, please feel free to do so. And thank you again for, for participating and for joining the webinar this morning. Thank you and out.